Yes, good morning. So thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to present this uh, work here. So this is work on the supersymmetric SUN Young Mills quantum mechanics. This is what I call it, but of course it's just a reduced super Young Mills theory down to zero plus one dimension. And maybe what we do differently from most of the other um, groups is that we are doing canonical simulations at fixed fermion number. And this by itself, of course, is uh, interesting to, to see how this works. And this is a model where we can actually go through all the machinery and see uh, how this can maybe be implemented in, in a generic way. So this is work done in collaboration with Kyle Steinhauer, a former PhD student. This refers to that paper and that encompasses essentially the theoretical development of this form canonical formulation. And then the numerical stuff has been done with Georg Begner and Hang Liu. Uh, you can read it in, in these papers. So this is actually somewhat old results, which I'm going to show you. It's preliminary in the sense that uh, Hang Liu, the postdoc, she went on maternity leave one year ago and essentially didn't return. So I'm afraid we have to, you know, do the final analysis by ourselves. I don't want to, sp to spend too much um, uh, time on the motivation. This is the workshop where we discuss exactly these things. The only thing is that we are concentrating on this corner here, super young mills in zero plus one dimension. So we are looking at the zero brains, thermodynamics of the zero brains. The motivation here is essentially threefold. First of all, we have interesting physics. That's what we are talking about at this workshop here. The second motivation is that in the model we are going to study, uh, essentially I will concentrate on SUN with N equals two, two color, super young males. There is some interesting expectations about the spectrum. So one expects, depending on the fermion number, on the fermion sector you are in, you expect either a discrete uh, spectrum or a continuous spectrum, which actually reaches down to zero which obviously is related to the flat directions which you have in the system. So there are predictions by Wosiek and Veneziano about this, and it would be interesting to see whether one can actually confirm this. <clears throat> um, the other thing is related to the, to the canonical formulation. There's a, some kind of interesting bosonization, which has to do with the fact that we can reformulate this theory using fermion loops. So that's some sort of a bosonization of the theory. It turns out that the fermionic contribution to the partition function decomposes into fermion sectors, and that actually allows for a local fermion algorithm. So we, are, we can do something else than having Monte Carlo, and this is actually quite important to understand the flat directions and get those under control. And what is also quite nice is that the structure which allows us to do so is the same also in QCD. So maybe this is less interesting for the audience here, but for me coming from QCD, of course, this is a you know, main motivation. So all I'm going to discuss can in principle be applied to QCD. So we start from this theory, n equals one super young males in either four or 10 dimensions. We reduce it down to zero plus one dimension. This is the action which you get. Um, so we have covariant derivatives sitting here and there for the fermions. They contain the time component of the gauge field in this covariant derivatives. We have spatial components of the gauge field in higher dimensions become the bosonic fields one to d minus one, and they are sitting in this uh, potential term here, this is the kinetic term for them, and then they interact via Yukawa type interaction with the fermions. So this is all known, we have discussed this quite a lot at this workshop. The fermionic fields are anti-commuting, and the sigmas which sit here in this Yukawa type um, interaction are the gamma matrices in d dimension. All fields are in the adjoint representation of SUN. Now, what I'm going to do for this talk is actually concentrate on E equals four, so then we only have three bosonic fields, one, two, three. The fermionic um, fields become complex two component spinners, and these are just the Pauli matrices. So this is just to set up uh, what we are going to do. So now we are discretizing the bosonic part. This is just a standard discretization on a lattice with this kind of uh, covariant derivative. Again, that's uh, straightforward. And um, for the Wilson, uh, for the fermions, we use the Wilson term. And it turns out that in one dimension, zero plus one dimension, the Wilson term, this is this part here, you can introduce it with a plus or a minus one, depending on the Wilson, uh, Wilson coefficient. You get essentially just the forward or the backward derivative in one dimension. Again, this is something which is well known. But that um, <clears throat> regulates the, the fermion doubles for us. So more specifically, we have this kind of expression on the lattice. This is a bit complicated, but I have to introduce it here for, for the purpose of fixing not the notation. 
So here we have a hopping turn for the fermion. And at the same time, I'm now introducing a chemical potential. So the chemical potential only acts when the fermion is moving or propagating forward in time. Since we have now introduced Wilson fermions, we have only hopping forward in time. So there's no fermion hopping backward in time. So the Wilson term essentially breaks the charge conjugation in this model here. So this you can see from this um, explicit form of the action. These are the adjoint um, gauge links, which take this form here. And this is essentially now the Yukawa type interaction with the bosonic fields. So this is a Yukawa interaction matrix, if you want, which carries um, flavor indices and color indices AC. So this is the Yukawa interaction matrix. It has this size here, two times n squared minus one, because we are in the adjoint representation. The two here is from the Dirac structure, and it takes this form here. <clears throat> so now what we are going to do is to dimensionally reduce this even further. So there's a technique which actually we um, developed together with Andre Alexandru some years ago, and you can apply for QCD, and here you can now apply this in, in this simple model here. At finite density, you reduce this to a, essentially a matrix model. So you end up expressing your determinant for periodic or anti-periodic boundary conditions as a determinant of this object here, where here we are, have now just a product of, on the one hand, these, you know, localized on a given time slice Yukawa interactions times the hopping term taking you from one time slice to the next time slice. And the uh, um, dependence of the, on the chemical potential just appears in this way here. So this form here is actually remis reminiscent to what uh, Shailish also, you know, mentioned in his talk, he had, he, he calls this one plus or minus B or something like this, I, I, product of the Bs, which we discussed yesterday. So that's the dimensional reduction of the determinant. This matrix here in the standard QCD would just have a spatial extent. Here, these matrices just have degrees of freedom, which are flavor degrees of freedom, flavor and Dirac degrees of freedom. So just extend two times N squared minus one squared. So now we can do the fugacity expansion if you want to work in a canonical setup. So you just expand this term here. This is quite easy. You just expand this determinant and you pick up all the terms where you have the fugacity to some power which defines for you the number of flavors which you want to simulate and the coefficients are the canonical determinants which you actually want to simulate in your system. As I said before, charge conjugation in principle ensures the symmetry between sectors so if you have, for example, the two maximal sectors, maximal number of fermions or zero number of fermions or minimal number of fermions, then these two coefficients should be related by charge conjugation. In this case, this is not true because the Wilson term breaks this symmetry. And we expect that this is restored in the continuum and this is actually also what we observe. Okay, so these are the can canonical determinants we which we want to simulate. And it turns out that you can make those real. And in fact, it turns out that if you go to these, um, you know, maximal sectors, either zero fermions or the maximal number of fermions, which in this case are, of course, two times n squared minus one, this sector here actually con um, corresponds to the quenched simulation. All the fermions are essentially, um, um, how do you say, saturate the lattice. So they cannot give, they cannot move around and they cannot give a fermionic contribution. So the determinant is actually one. That's the quenched. That's what we usually quen call a quenched approximation, but of course that's in the theory if you go to the correct uh, fermion number sector. So in these two sectors, it turns out that the determinant is actually positive. In all the other sectors, we don't know what is going to happen. We know that in general, if you introduce a chemical potential, finite density, you will encounter a sign problem, and I'm going to discuss what is happening in this case here. Okay, so now let me go through a little bit of algebra. <clears throat> So the canonical determinants, if you want to calculate them explicitly, can be expressed in terms of the elementary symmetric functions SK of order K of the eigenvalues of this product here. Um, so this is this product, I call it T. If you calculate the eigenvalues, you construct these uh, elementary symmetric functions and the determinant, canonical determinants are just expressed in, in these functions. As a, in terms of the eigenvalues of this reduced flavor Dirac matrix. And the crucial object is essentially this product of the 
um, interaction, you carve a type matrix times the hopping from one slide time slice to the next. And it turns out that one can show that this is actually a product of transfer matrices. I'm going to go through the proof of this via the fermion loop formulation because that allows to explicitly construct in each fermion sector the transfer matrix or the transfer matrices. Of course, these transfer matrices depend on the gauge field and on the bosonic fields at each time slice. So how does that work? So the configurations can, of course, be classified according to the number of fermions which propagate in time. So here is, for example, the fermion number sector one. So you see that you have one fermion which propagates from one time slice to the next. On a given time slice, it can hop around and change its flavor and Dirac um, index, and then it wraps around the lattice. It has to be a closed loop. And what you also can see, again, that relates to what uh, Shailesh is telling us since many years, that essentially on a given time slice, you have some kind of fermion back. So this would be a fermion back. These two sides are essentially taken out of the lattice because a fermion is propagating through them, and then the rest you have to sum over all the different com, um, uh, contributions on a given time slice. And if you calculate those contributions, that is a contribution to your transfer matrix. It corresponds to an, a matrix element of your transfer matrix. So this is the maximal sector, so this is the quenched one. You have the maximum number of fermions propagating. Of course, they can you know, propagate diagonally from one time slice to the other, but they can also interchange flavor and Dirac structure in this way, but they have to, it has to be a gauge invariant state. Or zero flavor sec, zero fermion sector, which means that the bags con contain essentially contributions on a given time slice, so that's just the determinant which you calculate on that time slice, and that's your um, transfer matrix element which you have to calculate. <clears throat> so this is how it looks like. Now we have to go through a calculation and calculate all these contributions, sum them up, and that's your transfer matrix. So let me introduce a notation for these transfer matrices. We have two types of transfer matrices. So this here, referring to the Yukawa type interaction, sums up the local vacuum fluctuations or contributions on a given time slice coming from the interaction within the flavor and Dirac indices. And then you have a transfer matrix taking you from one time slice to the next, which depends on the gauge field. And that essentially projects onto gauge invariant states and makes sure that you only look at um, closed fermion loops, essentially, wrapping around the temporal direction. So explicitly, it turns out that you can do this calculation. And uh, the matrices take this form, the matrix elements. And it turns out that this is just a cofactor of this flavor Dirac interaction matrix, Yukawa interaction matrix. And for the hopping from one time slice to the next, this is just the minor of the um, hopping of the, of the gauge field matrix W. <clears throat> so of course, the size of these transfer matrices are given by the number of states, which define essentially the Fox space of your, for your given in your um, occupation number basis, if you want to say so. And this depends on the number of maximal fermions you can have, and uh, the sector NF which you are in. Of course, if you are in the middle, so you have essentially half of the fermions are active, then this, uh, not the number of states grows factorially. So it's a, in principle, a, these matrices can be very huge. In the extremal sectors, they are very simple. So in the quenched sector or NF equals zero sector, then this is just one number. So the fermionic contribution to the partition function is now simply just taking this product of the transfer matrices, slice, time slice after time slice, and then take the trace, sum over all these many states, take all these contributions into account. So let me write this again. So this is uh, what we just had derived. Now one can use a gauche binet formula and some algebra to actually show that instead of multiplying these transfer matrices in this huge basis, and then calculating this matrix element at the end, and you take the trace of that huge matrix, you can first just do the product in the standard formulation. I mean, these are just n squared minus one times two squared matrices. And then at the end, take the cofactor or the minor. So that's, of course, a quite a, um, a simplification of the system. That's one way to look at it. And then taking the trace here essentially amounts to taking the sum over all the principal minors of this product of, of minor and cofactor matrices. So this is what I, how I denoted here. 
So finally, one can prove by linear algebra that this sum over the principal minors of this product of transform matrices is actually equivalent to the symmetric, uh, completely symmetric function of the eigenvalues of the product here. So everything matches and uh, works out as it should. But of course, these transform matrices give us a different picture on the problem and maybe also a different algorithmic approach to how to simulate the system. So the crucial object is uh, essentially this um, reduced matrix, the product of these transform matrices. And as I said before, this, the proof of this is applicable to QCD. The algebraic structure is essentially exactly the same. So in principle, you can do exactly the same thing in QCD. Okay, let me move on. Um, now, let's, we want to evaluate. So what we have to do in a simulation, if we want to calculate the partition function in a canonical sector, we integrate over the gauge field, the bosonic fields with the action, and this is, this is the fermionic contribution, which I just derived, the sum over the principal minors. And as I said, I mean, this, is, this matrix is still large. I mean, the number of principal minors in the middle sector, you know, where you have half of the fermions excited or active, I mean, this is huge. For SU3, for example, the middle sector, you have 20,000 of these principal minors. And if you go to four, five, and so on, it grows, as I said, uh, factorially. So this is what I said here. So one way to deal with this is actually treat this sum over the fermion states or the Fox pay over the Fox states stochastically. So we treat it as a dynamical degree of freedom and just you know, don't sum over everything at once, but you just let the Monte Carlo decide which of the states are important and which are not. And then, which means that you start with an index set which labels a certain Fox space. Then you propose to move to another Fox space. There's a, actually a, a neat algorithm to go through all permutations um, in a uniform way, Fisher Yates reshuffling. And then the new random set, the new Fox state, this is accepted with some probability, with, with the Metropolis probability. So we can actually do Metropolis algorithm, Metropolis update in this system here. So the calculation of T, of course, might be, this is a matrix multiplication, you have to multiply all these transform matrices together. It turns out that you can arrange your data in a, bi in a very efficient binary tree data structure in such a way that you, if you update, for example, the Yukawa matrix at some time slice one, then you only calculate this product and that product and the last product. So the number of matrix multiplications doesn't grow with LT, it's the extent of the temporal direction, but only logarithmically. Of course, that's a huge saving, which you can do <clears throat> here. So, okay, let me now go to uh, some, show you some simulation results. We are concentrating in this talk to n equals two, which means that the maximum number of fermions you can have in this system is six. So this is the smallest possible system, but just to start uh, how, how this looks like, um, we, we concentrate on this. So we have seven sectors going from zero to six. As I said, zero, um, no fermion is active. That corresponds in the charge symmetric, you know, if charge symmetry is restored, this would mean that you have three anti-quarks, or uh, sorry, anti-fermions. And this sector here where you have, in this formulation, six fermions means in the continuum limit, three fermions. And the middle sector, three here would mean that you are at half filling, essentially. But the labeling here is more natural in terms of, of uh, the Wilson fermions. And six is the quenched sector. <clears throat> so we will measure essentially the Polyakov loop. Um, actually, I'm not showing any result for the Polyakov loop, I think. But uh, what is interesting, of course, is to look at the, the moduli of the bosonic fields. This is what we discussed at length over the last few days and was also mentioned again by Andreas in the previous talk. So the obvious questions which we have to address here is, what about the sign problem? These canonical determinants, are they well defined? Or are they suffering from a sign problem? And what about the flat directions? And the way we deal with the flat directions is just to introduce this uh, mass term here to regularize those flat directions. And we know how to deal with this. In principle, you have to take, um, remove this regulator. And the, the way you take the limits, whether you take whether you remove the regulator before you take the lattice spacing to zero or vice versa, this is, of course, one has to be very careful with that. In principle, what you should do is you should fix your mass regulator, take the continuum limit, and then in the continuum, remove the regulator. I think this is the safe procedure to do. Okay, so let me 
let's look at the, the sign of, of the determinant in just these sectors here, 0, 2, 3, 4, and 6, it turns out that in those sectors we don't have a sign problem. 0 and 6, one can prove that the determinant is positive. So let's look at, uh, as an example, let's look at this half-filling sector here, and it turns out, so this is an example for NF equals 3 at beta 1.2 on a 24 lattice. And as you can see, this is a dis probability distribution of the determinant, and you have a little bit of a negative contribution, but it's essentially negligible. I mean, of course, you can take it into account to make everything exact, but it's compared to the positive contributions, it's, it's not relevant. What I compare here, green and blue, is essentially green is the complete determinant if you sum over all these principal minors. And instead, if you just um, stochastically evaluate just a single minor and update this as a dynamical degree of freedom, you see that you essentially um, that these two simulations follow each other very precisely. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So that's you just have to do half of them, I guess, right? Yeah. Well, and you have no sign problem for not quite because the charge oh. symmetry is broken. So right. there's there's this symmetry uh, okay, between yeah. you know the the sector two and four, for example, mm. one and five, zero yeah. and six, yeah. but yeah. not that finite lattice space. Yeah. I would have expected the same problem for n equals three, but okay. Yeah. Okay, so actually one can look at, um, I mean, this is now the mass regulator, which I introduced, and we can look at the sign of the matrix as a function of this mass regulator, and it turns out that the mass regulator actually introduces a, a, a sign problem. So if you choose this to be too large, then you, you see that the sign goes towards um, um, zero, but of course the limit you are interested is in is this one here. So this is for n f equals two and four, and you see that if you remove, this is now at fixed lattice spacing, but if you would remove this mass regulator, you end up being at uh, one. This is for a coarse lattice spacing, red is a final lattice spacing, green is yet another lattice, uh, final lattice spacing, so you could take at fixed m the continuum limit first, and then remove the regulator to one. And this is what is done here. So here, um, essentially, this is the for now ML equals zero because in this case it doesn't really matter. So you see that this actually extrapolates to one in the continuum limit, so there is no sign problem at all. <coughs> you, so this is ML equals zero. So here we didn't do the proper, um, you know, limits. So we first took ML to zero because it was not problematic, and then take the lattice spacing to zero. So this is this has to do with the fact that this is this is what I meant at the beginning. This is a preliminary analysis. One should do it properly, but the conclusions will be the same. Now let's move to the sector one and five, and it turns out here we have a sign problem, in the sense that this is now the distribution again of the determinant and one of the minors which we simulate. Here is zero, so we have contributions which are positive, but we also have contributions which are which are negative. But they, it turns out that they are. Not ex I mean, the cancellation is not exact. It's actually, you know, uh, some fraction which is uh, negative. And it turns out that, first of all, this negative part is absolutely crucial. If you re do a reweighting from one sector to the other, which you can actually do here, I mean, th these cancellations are physical. You need them to get the physics right. If you just neglect them, everything is wrong. But it turns out that if you take the continuum limit, this distribution is actually fixed. So in that sense, there's no real assigned problem if you can get the relative weighting of these two contributions correctly. And it turns out that this is what you can do. This is the same plot as before. The sign for different lattice spacings as a function of the regulator for a given lattice spacing. And if you do the continuum limit, then this is what you get. So everything is nicely under control and it extrapolates to a small value, 0.12 or whatever, but, but in print, I mean, you, you have it under control. Now, um, maybe this is just to show a comparison with our Metropolis algorithm in red with the Hybin Monte Carlo algorithm. Of course, the Hybin Monte Carlo algorithm has a problem to visit this negative um, contributions because it wants to go through this zero here, but it cannot. The Metropolis has no problem at all because this is essentially you, you do finite steps. So you ju just jump into the negative sector, you sample there, you jump back and forth. It's a local algorithm. So there's no problem, there's no critical slowing down because you don't feel the zero mode, which is uh, related to, the, to, to that zero here. 
which also means that we can, of course, do simulations um, at periodic boundary conditions where you have these zero modes without any problems. So, okay, let me discuss the flat directions. The system may suffer from this running away, as we discussed. And um, there exist metastable states in which to, where x squared can become very large and also the gauge field freezes. So here is a simulation, two million updates. And you see how x squared, the size of this extent of the bosonic fields, how this uh, behaves. And you see huge autocorrelation times. I mean, this is a million or more. And of course, what you also see is that the Polyakov loop freezes and shows huge autocorrelation times. So you just don't know what to do with these, uh, with, with, with these simulations. In principle, you have to throw them away. This is a distribution of this, um, of, of this Monte Carlo history here. So which value does it take, x squared? Is it this one here, this peak, or that peak, or this peak? No, no chance. So we came up with a multiplicative random walk update, which essentially tries to probe these flat directions by multiplying all bosonic fields with a constant factor. And then what we get is the red simulation here with a beautiful distribution. So you can actually really um, nicely uh, probe this flat direction at the stable state. Now let me um, move a little bit more quickly. So what, what you can now do is to you study this x squared expectation of the bosonic field as a function of the mass regulator. And what you see is that you see that you sometimes I mean that you can see depending on the starting configuration this kind of run away as you remove the regulator. If you start with a with a with a with a, with a configuration which has just small fluctuations around zero then you end up here. So you see that it's very important to control these things. First of all, you need a good algorithm to probe these flat directions without, I mean, you have to get rid of the critical slowing down or the, yeah, in order to probe this precisely. And you see that this is actually really diverging. And then you have to make sure and hope that, you know, this transition which you have here, that this metastable state is actually removed as you go towards the continuum limit. You have to check that this is the case. Otherwise, you end up in the wrong um, in an unphysical lattice artifact phase. <clears throat> but if you do it carefully, then this is what comes out. So again, this is trace of x squared as a function of the regulator for in the sector zero and six. For different lattice spacing, this is the coarsest, finer, finer, and finer, and so on. For nf equals zero, you see you can now extrapolate at fixed m to the continuum limit. This is the quenched sector, and you see the dashed line lie on top of each other, which just means that in the quenched sector, the lattice artifacts start with order A squared instead of order A in the standard approach. So this is now the continuum limit for this quantity. And you see now this degeneracy of the sectors, 0 and 6, is restored. I mean, charge conjugation is restored in the continuum limit as it should. So it goes to the same um, continuum limit. And we can do the same thing in the sector 1 and 5, where we have this sign problem. But again, as you see, I mean, these are data with errors. You just don't see them because they are so small. Even after reweighting, it's just a small effect, a 10% you know, reweighting essentially. And again, in the, in, in the continuum limit, removing, um, I mean, this is now for a fixed regulator today, you see that everything is degenerate as it should be. Charge conjugation is restored. Now, interestingly, if you look at two and four sector, and the three sector is exactly the same. Here we now see that if you remove the regulator, that actually the expectation value of x becomes larger and larger. So here something might, hap might, hap might be happening, and this is not the metastable state I was discussing before. This is with the regulator where we have this metastable you know, fluctuation completely under control. And if you take the continuum limit here, you see that in fact this diverges. So this is at fixed fermion number, sector two, three and four are essentially the same. Actually, it turns out that they are essentially degenerate, something which I don't really understand why, but it turns out that the charge symmetry um, is restored already at finite lattice spacing in these two sectors here. But this is now this runaway of the flat direction. It's not a metastable state, this is physics. I mean, there is really one direction, but only in a certain fermionic sector where you have a runaway. And of course, if one would measure the spectrum, energy spectrum, I would expect that you see an energy state going down to zero and developing a continuous range of energy states in that sector. You can do the same thing for periodic or anti-periodic boundary conditions. And as we discussed again before, for anti-periodic boundary conditions, you have a problem. These are thermal boundary conditions. And then you see this you know, divergence in your system. 
if you choose periodic boundary conditions, these are the lines down here, then this flat direction is regulated by a zero mode appearing for periodic boundary conditions. And this is now the continuum limit of the same quantity for periodic boundary conditions, it goes to a finite value. For anti-periodic boundary conditions, it just diverges. And um, other quantities remain finite. So for example, this is a plot of the energy, the bosonic energy, which should go in this case to 4.5. For periodic, it goes exactly to 4.5 on the level of 10 to the minus 4 in this case, as it should. Supersymmetry is restored. While if you choose thermal boundary conditions, it, everything is finite, even though you have this runaway of, into the flat direction in some of the sectors. But it turns out that actually if you look at the periodic boundary conditions, this, these flat directions are cancelling each other in, with the periodic boundary conditions. So everything is fine and under control, and it goes to a value which is a little bit below, and this is essentially what we try to calculate and see whether this matches the gauge gravity uh, dual prescription. Okay, that brings me to my conclusions. I think in this case, n equals 4, 0 plus 1, super young is quantum mechanics. This is well understood, under good control. All we have to do is to just simulate it and get the results. So we have a essentially a complete description of the phase structure, including these metastable states, which are somehow, I, we would in, we interpret them as a lattice artifact, which you have to uh, control if you do simulations. And then, of course, it's, that's an open question, how you interpret these divergences. They are related to thermodynamics of black holes and so on. It would be interesting to study also the large end limit, etc. So, in all of this, the canonical formulation was crucial because it solves and avoids the fermion sign problem. You can get these flat directions under control because you have control over periodic and anti-periodic boundary conditions. And as I said before, maybe not appealing to everybody, but everything here is applicable to QCD just as an outlook. Thank you. Uh, questions? Last plot. So you say anti-periodic and periodic goes to the same value, and it's, uh, so it's massless. And anti-periodic theory hit the flat direction. Exactly. So that that's at the, after you remove the regulator. So the periodic here goes to 4.5 exactly uh, at the level of 10 to the minus 4. I mean the error is 10 to the minus 4, and we reach 4.5 at this level. While here we see a small deviation, as I think you would expect. That's at finite temperatures. So okay. So I, th this. I think in anti-periodic theory, if uh, so, eigenvalue just a flat goes to flat direction. So SU2 just breaks to U1. I mean, it's just a free theory, I think. Then probably you can articulate calculate the energy. It's just a... Well, it seems that in this case, I mean, you have the, I mean, if, if you look at the anti-periodic case here, you see these flat directions. This is the... That yeah, yeah, so, so, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. So what I said is when uh, theory hit flat direction, mm -hmm. so uh, gauge symmetry breaks to U1. So in the SU, SUN case, it just breaks to U1 to the N minus one. Mm -hmm. And uh, off-diagonal elements are infinitely heavy. So they just decouple, mm -hmm. but it's a joint theory, so it's just a free theory. So I think uh, you can just uh, calculate the uh, energy of a free theory analytically, and uh, then it should reproduce uh, this value. And I don't know why it should agree with the periodic boundary condition, but in periodic boundary condition, just uh, probably just uh, because the uh, partial function is zero, probably you just have to count the uh, ferromagnetic degrees of freedom or something. If I take the no, to zero, then it should be with um, the value from the periodic boundary conditions. So then, you know, I take the extent to infinity. So, so, I, so in, periodic, in periodic boundary condition, uh, still there is dynamics in the sense uh, SU2 is not broken because the flat direction is lifted. But in anti-periodic theory, you, uh, in, so, so in this case, you know, N, uh, N is too small, so you, you cannot see metastable bound state, and you are actually seeing a free phase. So there is no dynamics. And I think if you calculate other quantities, you should see difference. And probably, I think energy is just determined by kinematics. In a, at a periodic boundary condition, because you, essentially you just count the degrees of freedom, right? And uh, in anti periodic theory, if, uh, same, if it just becomes free theory, it's just a triviality. You know, it's also, you just count the degrees of freedom. So I, I, that's my guess, and I'm not 100% sure.
Um, I want to understand a little better the uh, uh, realization of the fermion determinant. Um, is it, you mentioned it was a dimensional reduction of it, but is that, is it an exact reformulation? Yes. And how sensitive is it to the form of the, uh, of the lattice discretization? So this here is done for Wilson fermions where, where it's quite straightforward. You can, I know one can do it with staggered fermions. Although I think there the interpretation in terms of, of um, fermion loops is not completely straightforward in the sense that you can interpret, I mean, Shailesh knows this much better, of course, whether you can actually assign to a given loop configuration a fermion number. But in principle, the dimensional reduction works very similar, yes. You, you, you also use the first order formulation of the derivative, if I understood correctly. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And will it change if I use higher order formulation? Uh, I mean, if you ha use higher order der derivatives, for example, then of course, first of all, you couple more than one time slice with each other. So that complicates things. So you would introduce a uh, um, transfer matrix, which, you know, is not a transfer matrix from one time slice to the other, but actually takes informations from previous time slices and so on. So it complicates things. I don't know how it would look like in that case. Yes. Um, can you say anything about where the ground state is in which sector? In a, in a sort of a, you're almost close to a Hamiltonian formulation with the transfer matrix. Uh, so we could ask these questions. So I mean, the, the quantum field theoretic, well, the quantum mechanical ground state. Huh? So, so it's interesting if you look at this antibiotic boundary conditions where each of the sectors essentially contributes positively. You add them up positively. So then everything is dominated by the middle sector, NF equals 3. Uh, if you if you compare the relative weight between the sectors, then it's orders of magnitude essentially. But interestingly, if you go to periodic, then you have alternating signs of the contributions of the various fermion. Um, you know, whether it, you have an even number of fermions or an odd number of fermions determines the sign. And then it turns out that, for example, you have a cancellation between the three sector and the two and four, which come with different signs. Mm -hmm. and Interestingly, this cancellation is essentially exact even at finite lattice spacing. I mean, this, uh, I told you before, the two and four sector mm -hmm. are degenerate even at finite lattice spacing. In principle, you would not expect that, but this seems to be happening here. So the, the, the three middle sectors, two, three, and four, essentially cancel each other. And then you have a combination of the zero, one, and five, six sectors, which make the ground state in, in the, for the periodic case. So again, I think it makes sense because in the middle sector from two to two, three, four, this is where you see the, the, the divergence of the x squared. So that gets removed in, in this way. So for the antibody particle collision, where you have problems in the middle sectors with uh, stability, is it the same that the physics is really it's a zero, one, and five, six sectors? So that Uh, maybe one more question. If there are no more questions, let's thank Urs again.